All right, and we're back with the second half. And I want to mention that there is a video clip related to climate change that I want you to watch, and that's another episode of Frozen Planet. And this time it relates more heavily to the effects of climate change in the polls. Um, you only need to watch the part about Antarctica. You can watch the rest if you'd like. Um, but I will say that uh, this episode was apparently controversial enough that it was not aired on American network TV or put on Amazon Amazon Prime streaming because the science of climate change is controversial in the US politically. I find that very frustrating, but moving on. So I mentioned that the second half of the lecture would talk a little bit about the climate cycle, the, the carbon cycle and feedbacks. So I'll start the second half of the lecture by talking about what the carbon cycle is. And remember that when I talked about glaciers before, I briefly introduced the water cycle to put glaciers in context. And the water cycle outlines all of the reservoirs, which are places where water remains for any period of time, as well as the paths connecting them, like evaporating evaporation connecting water in the ocean and water in the atmosphere. And you can create similar diagrams for other substances that cycle between different forms, like how water goes between being a solid and liquid, and different reservoirs, like the atmosphere and the ocean. And this can indeed be done for carbon. Carbon is present in all living organisms. It's also present in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide and in the ocean as carbonic acid and the solid calcium carbonate shells of corals, snails, or even phytoplankton. And we often focus on the processes that either add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere or remove it from the atmosphere um, because the atmosphere is where the action is. It's the reservoir we're interested in because it is the change in atmospheric CO2 that is having such a big effect on the Earth's climate. And Earth's atmosphere is one, one reservoir of CO2. And like any reservoir, the atmosphere is going to have sources in regards to carbon dioxide. Um, and the sources are processes that add CO2 to the atmosphere. And then there will be sinks in, um, or processes that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, often by converting carbon dioxide into another compound actually. And that's the interesting thing about the carbon cycle. Um, the water cycle usually just involves phase changes. The carbon cycle does involve phase, phase changes between gaseous carbon dioxide and solid carbonate or solid hydrocarbons. Um, but carbonate and hydrocarbons are carbon in different molecular forms. It also involves a molecular chemical change. And the main sources of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are the decomposition of dead matter, um, or when, or simply, or also when when animals or when organisms eat other animals because that produces that produces CO two via cell respiration. Um, as well as burning of organic matter, so just fire, wildfires, as well as burning of fossil fuels, and then volcanic eruptions, because volcanic eruptions emit carbon dioxide among the various gases that you get in the fumes. Um, carbon dioxide is going to be in the bubbles that you see in a, in a video or picture of lava, and the bubbles are formed by the gases escaping. Um, but carbon dioxide can also be removed from the atmosphere um, by a number of processes, and these are kind of what you'd consider the sort of natural carbon sequestration processes. Unfortunately, they're all quite slow. Fossil fuels actually form as one sequestration of carbon. Um, what happens with fossil fuels actually is that the coal in the Antarctic coal swamps, for example, was buried so quickly by the accumulation of plant matter above it that it became buried and formed coal before it could rot and form CO2. Um, the fact that coal is there actually means that it didn't rot all the way. Um, some of that carbon became hydrocarbons buried underground rather than ending up as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so it is kind of funny that the formation of fossil fuels actually removes carbon dioxide. Um, and oil and coal being there plays a role in sequestering carbon, but humans have undone that by digging it up and burning it a lot faster than would have happened through, nat through the vast majority of natural processes. Um, like, like, yeah, it, it'll get used up by natural processes. Like if there's an oil field sitting on a plate of oceanic crust, that will subduct eventually. But humans humans are digging that up a lot faster than, than would happen naturally. Um, now, aside from that, another sink is how um, carbon dioxide dissolved in seawater undergoes a series of reactions to become the carbonate ion, which can combine with calcium ions to form a solid substance called calcium carbonate. And that's the substance that coral reefs and snail shells are made out of. And the living organisms themselves actually secrete the substance from the dissolved ions in the water. They're the ones providing the energy and playing their role in sequestering carbon. 
And something on land that serves a similar purpose is trees and other long-lived plant species converting CO2 into the hydrocarbons that are making up their pulp, their bark, and their wood. And also erosion removes CO2. Um, one thing I'll talk about is that there's a chemical process that we'll discuss in which um, in which minerals that have minerals that remove that have silica are removed by slightly acidic rainwater, and the acid in that rainwater actually comes from CO2 that the rainwater interacts with. So volcanoes can actually affect global warming in two different ways, or they can affect global climate in two separate ways, is what I meant to say. And volcanic eruptions do emit carbon dioxide. And a lot of the CO2 comes from, actually comes from carbonates that have previously been subducted. Because remember that a lot of volcanoes show up at convergent plate boundaries, at subduction zones. Um, the carbonate in the shells on the ocean ends up on the ocean floor, and the ocean floor gets subducted eventually. And the carbonate converts back into carbon dioxide as the downgoing plate, which is carrying the ocean sediments, gets warmer and starts to go deeper into the earth. So the gaseous CO2 mixes with the molten rock, um, the magma, along with other gases like water vapor and then poisonous sulfuric gases you don't wanna, you don't wanna breathe in. Um, but when a volcano erupts, it releases that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, geologically speaking, a period of increased volcanism is likely to be somewhat warmer, or at least that's, that's, that's what we would expect because of increased carbon dioxide emissions. And remember that when we talked about Snowball Earth, the period um, in very early Earth history in which the entire planet was basically covered by ice, the best hypothesis for what brought an end to it was that plate tectonics brought about increased volcanism. There was more subduction going on overall, and that meant more volcanoes and more volcanic eruptions. And that released enough CO2 over time that the Earth warmed enough for Snowball Earth to come to an end. And so volcanoes do produce, produce CO2, but they also release solid particles into the air, especially with really explosive eruptions like Mount Vesuvius or Mount St. Helens. The volcanoes are going to release ejecta into the air, ash and pieces of rock. And a lot of the really small pieces, just the ash, will remain suspended in the air. They can stay in the atmosphere, suspended up in the atmosphere for years after an eruption because they're so light. And their presence, you can often, the air will kind of look dirty because there's just more particulate matter, particulate matter in it. Um, those solid particles, those aerosols, these solid particles suspended in air, they will actually block some sunlight from reaching the earth. Um, they will reduce the amount of solar radiation reaching the earth and they will cause global cooling. And if you look at some of the largest volcanic eruptions in human times, they've actually been followed by pretty miserable winters and kind of non-existent summers. There was um, an especially big eruption in Indonesia was followed by what is known as the year without a summer because of the sheer amount of debris that was released by that volcano and ended up all over the world. Um, the, thing is, the thing about volcanic debris is that it'll be kind of spread throughout all the world by air currents. So enough eruptions, enough eruptions can produce actually enough, enough ejecta, enough ash in the air to kind of produce a nuclear winter type effect when there's just, just debris in the air, just like little bits of debris in the air blocking sunlight. Um, if that sounds familiar, that's like what happened with the asteroid impact that killed most of the dinosaurs, that um, the asteroid broke into tiny pieces and the dust got thrown up, stayed in the atmosphere for several years, blocked out enough sunlight that plants started dying, and then the dinosaurs that depended on those plants also started dying. So volcanoes have a mixed effect, basically. And you have to consider how important the effect from CO2 is in a given context versus how important the contribution from, um, from aerosols is. And some volcanoes release carbon dioxide but aren't particularly explosive. So that's one example of where you might expect a volcano to contribute more to global warming. But importantly, the math does not add up because they can make an estimate for how much um, how much carbon dioxide is put out by human activities, and it's about 35 gigatons per year. Um, compared to that, all of the active volcanoes in the world produce at most 0.26 gigatons. That's several orders of magnitude smaller. And not to mention, there has not been a particularly increased mark in the number of volcanic eruptions since 1800. That's 
that doesn't really, it just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't match up. So volcanoes can't really be evoked, invoked to explain the current increase in carbon dioxide emissions, but they're interesting none, nonetheless for their role. Now I mentioned erosion. This might be a bit less familiar, but we've talked about erosion as just the removal of material, usually by glacier, by, by glaciers in this class usually. Um, but erosion in general refers to the breaking down and removal of material. And I've mostly talked about how that happens physically with glaciers plucking or abrading surfaces or wind blowing past rock surfaces to grind them down. But some erosion actually happens via chemical reactions. And what happens is that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere reacts with rainwater. And this forms a small amount of, carbon, of, of carbonic acid which is why rainwater tends to be slightly acidic. It's because the, the falling rain is encountering and dissolving CO2 in the atmosphere as it falls. Now, most of the minerals that make up the granite and the similar rocks that make up continental crust are silicate minerals. Their main ingredient, so to speak, is the element silica. Um, they also often have calcium in them though. And remember that calcium is important because the shells of the organisms in the ocean they're made of calcium carbonate and the calcium has to come from somewhere. That actually, the calcium actually comes from rocks weathered on land. Um, so in the example um, shown here, two carbon dioxide molecules and a water molecule interact with a calcium silicate mineral. Um, that's this thing here. And they produce just silica or quartz as well as calcium ions and bicarbonate ions. So these calcium ions and the bicarbonate ions are dissolved in water and the water eventually flows to the ocean and takes them there. In the ocean, the bicarbonate combines with the calcium to produce water, calcium carbonate, and one carbon dioxide atom. And notice that two carbon dioxide molecules are used in this process, but only one comes out. So that overall means that silicate weathering is a sink for atmospheric CO2. This process in practice puts calcium ions and bicarbonate ions into the water and they there are precipitated out of the water into the solid substance, calcium carbonate, as the shells of snails and these other organisms. It's the, it's the animals and plants that actually expend the energy to make this reaction happen and form solid calcium carbonate. And I will say actually that there are long-term links between rates of worldwide weathering and climate change. There's some there's some studies that link the uplift of the Himalaya, which was accompanied by, by fast erosion because things that are really high up break down fast under the influence of gravity. But they link that to the increase in erosion to a period of somewhat global cooling because the increase in silicate weathering, this process was taking more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, but on a human time scale, there's not, there's not going to be a major change that's going to change that's really going to affect how much CO2 is being left in the atmosphere or not left in the atmosphere by erosion. So it's an interesting part of the carbon cycle, but not really, can't really explain the current, it, it has really nothing to do with the current climate crisis at all. Um, but it is very important as the explanation for where the calcium that makes up the calcium carbonate and the ocean comes from. It comes from rocks on land. And the dissolved bicarbonate ions and calcium ions in the ocean are said to precipitate into carbonate and you need energy for that. And so it's organisms like the Nautilus or these corals or these foraminifera that do that. And actually a lot of carbonate is stored in the shells of the ocean's tiny unsung heroes, AKA phytoplankton. And as a sign of how diverse phytoplankton are, remember that phytoplankton is just a term for just the floating in the water organisms that do photosynthesis. But um, if you look at their genetics, they're all really different from, a lot of them are really, really different from one another. Um, and as a sign of that, some types of phytoplankton actually build their, when I mean build their shells, their, their cells have minerals in their cell walls. Um, they have basically mineralized cells. So their cell itself kind of has minerals in it. Um, and in some cases, actually diatoms and a few other phytoplankton do that with silica, not with carbonate. But a lot of them do it with carbonate, like foraminifera. And a lot of the carbonate made in the ocean is synthesized, is precipitated by, by phytoplankton. You can't see them, but there's tons and tons of them. So you just can't leave that out if you're considering the amount of carbonate being produced in the ocean. And so thus to a big extent, a healthy balance of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere can depend on healthy ecosystems. 
a lot of carbon sequestration is performed by animals and phytoplankton in the ocean. And this is, again, one reason why you don't want stuff like coral bleaching or you don't really want coral reefs to be suffering because a biodiversity loss and b also you suddenly you run the risk of having a lot fewer organisms that can effectively remove that can effectively build carbonate shells. Um, now I mentioned subduction before. When the carbonate organisms die, their shells don't spontaneously turn back into carbon dioxide usually. Um, as you've realized if you've ever gone on the beach and collected shells, um, the hard shells hold up much longer than do the softer parts. So you can find crab claws or snail shells long after the soft parts have decayed away. So in the ocean, the carbonate, including the carbonate that's just present in the in the mineralized cell walls of phytoplankton, ends up on the seafloor as these carbonate oozes of sorts, as, as a form of seafloor sediment, basically. And remember that the tectonic plates underlying the ocean will subduct eventually. They will sink into the mantle. And the sediments on top of this plate, including the oozes from the carbonate organisms, get carried into the mantle. And subduction overall functions as a sink for carbon and a method of carbon sequestration. And some of the subducted carbon, it does convert to CO2 and end up in the magmas released at volcanoes, but a lot of it just stays in the mantle for long periods. It might not emerge until much later. And subduction of carbonates thus puts carbon away overall. But it's true, it is worth considering that if you have a lot more subduction occurring, it is going to also cause an increased release in CO2 because volcanoes are going to be erupting. It's not, it's not quite a simple case of either or, but in general, in general, the takeaway is that plate tectonics has some influence over climate on a very long scale. Um, how much subduction is occurring at a given time is going to affect, affect climate to some degree. But this really cannot be evoked to, it, it cannot be invoked to explain the current climate crisis, which is kind of a theme I'm running into here. Now, all photosynthetic organisms take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in order to produce the hydrocarbons for food, as well as the hydrocarbons that make up their physical body. So the wood, the bark, and the leaves, and the pulp. Um, plants also do perform aerobic respiration, as do we. And that's the process in which they convert some of those hydrocarbons using oxygen um, and produce carbon dioxide in the process. And the interesting thing is that long lived plants with hard structures like trees and cacti sequester a lot more carbon than they release via cell respiration. The carbon is stuck in the tree until the tree dies or gets cut down or burnt. Well, the tree dies when it gets cut down, but I'm, I'm meaning like the tree, the tree kind of just reach, reaches the natural end of its life versus the whole forest gets cut down or burned down unceremoniously. Um, and one reason why deforestation aggravates the effects of anthropogenic climate change so much is that cutting down forests takes that sink of carbon away. It, re it replaces long lived plants that do a pretty effective job keeping carbon out of the atmosphere with grasses and shrubs that, that um, grow and die every season basically and decay and release and don't really do as effective a job of storing carbon away. Um, so you really wanna kind of think about how you do kind of want to think about how carbon cycles between different systems and changes forms, because living organisms are in general made of hydrocarbons. And if a living organism eats another organism, like if a leopard seal hunts on a penguin, the, the hydrocarbons in the prey will be converted to carbon dioxide inside the predator's body during the process of cell respiration. So eating organisms releases carbon dioxide and that can't really be helped. We need to do cell respiration. The same is true of decomposition, actually. Decomposition really is just fungi and bacteria and mold and other microorganisms eating the organism. Just, it looks like it's just turning to dirt from our perspective. Um, and fires, in a sense, do the same thing. Fires aren't living things, but they also kind of eat plant matter. They eat hydrocarbons and convert them into CO2. Um, and the energy, instead of being released to our bodies, gets released in the form of fire. Fire is kind of, fire to a big extent is, those, the bonds in those hydrocarbons being broken all at once and being released all at once. Um, but fossil fuels ironically serve as a geologic, pro geologic process that prevents some of these hydrocarbons from being burned or eaten. If the organic matter is buried under the right circumstances, the pressure from burial will preserve and concentrate the hydrocarbons before they can decay and convert to carbon dioxide. So you have the coal that formed during the Carboniferous period under layers and layers of dead vegetation and swamps. 
and you have the oil forming in often in layers of mud, you have trapped phytoplankton. And that's one reason why a lot of oil bearing rock layers originated as seafloor muds. Um, around Santa Barbara, the main oil producing rock unit is the Monterey Formation. And the Monterey Formation contains rock that used to be ocean mud, and there's oil trapped within that. Um, and natural gas, meanwhile, is the gas that forms alongside liquid oil from those very same phytoplankton. And geologically speaking, this takes millions of years. This is why fossil fuels are considered a non-renewable resource, because they aren't being formed during our lifetime, at least on a scale or at a, to a degree that's useful to us. So we've upended a geologic process that occurs over millions of years by digging out tons of that coal, oil, and natural gas over the course of just a few centuries. Um, so we've removed this fossil fuel that took millions of years to form, and without our involvement, it would have just stayed underground for millions of years longer. Um, we've thrown a wrench into the system of Earth by learning how to dig up all this buried carbon and, geologically speaking, setting it all on fire at once. And remember when I talked about the last time, um, geologically speaking, a bunch of carbon, carbon got set on fire at once, that was the Permian extinction. And the Permian extinction was so devastating to a big degree because of ocean acidification. Um, and I don't need you to memorize the exact chemical formulas for all of this. I will have some kind of a schematic of how this happens chemically on the next slide. But what's happened is that the oceans in general serve as a buffer for carbon dioxide. The ocean, ocean water can absorb a lot of CO2, like CO2 can be dissolved in ocean water. The oceans have dissolved about a third of all of the CO2 CO2 that's been released by humans. So the oceans have absorbed a lot of the excess carbon dioxide. And that's not really good. We've basically put the ocean under strain and it's losing its ability to function as a carbon sink. So ocean water, the amount of CO2 in ocean water is regulated by the temperature as well as a number of reactions between carbon dioxide and solid calcium carbonate that I mentioned earlier. Now, if you have too much CO2 in the atmosphere, that will be absorbed by the ocean and an excess of CO2 in the ocean will cause an excess of carbonic acid. And that long-term has made it harder for ocean organisms to precipitate calcium carbonate and build their shells. And studies have found that we have cases of the larvae of crabs or of snails, which have really tiny delicate shells. They're dying and the eggs aren't hatching because the shells are getting even more weak and fragile than before because there is not sufficient carbonate available for them to build those shells. And corals have come under stress in particular, both because of the, the difficulty in precipitating calcium carbonate and also the rising temperature of water. Um, coral bleaching occurs when corals release the algae that they are dependent on. Corals need algae to survive and they'll expel the algae when they're when, when they're under a lot of stress kind of as a last resort method they'll let the algae start growing there again if they recover but if the corals stay under stress for a long time they will die basically they will die, they will they will they will lose their color from the loss of the algae and they will die and this is kind of scary because coral reefs are really important biologically they support fisheries, they support a lot of species, and dead coral reefs mean a lot of dead fish. And this is kind of the series of reactions, and I don't need you to memorize this, but I'll kind of walk you through why this leads to ocean acidification. So the increased amount of carbonic acid produces, so you have CO2 dissolved in the ocean water, and that reacts with, with water to form carbonic acid. And carbonic acid then will Carbonic acid then will start breaking down and it'll, it'll form bicarbonate as well as H plus ions. And a lot of H plus ions in the, and this, this actually is going to end up producing more H plus ions than bicarbonate ions. There's, there's the presence of, the presence of lots of carbonic acid really puts a lot more H plus ions than there usually are. And what happens, what happens then is that you have a reaction in which um, bicarbonate converts to carbonate as well as another H plus ion. Um, what happens is that some of the carbonate that's already in the ocean, the carbonate ion, combines with the extra hydrogen plus ions to make more bicarbonate because 
because there's because there's a lot more H plus than bicarbonate. It's an, it's imbalanced. So in other words, adding more carbonic acid actually takes carbonate that's already in the ocean out overall. And this means that there's fewer carbonate ions for the corals and snails and phytoplankton to extract and build their shells. And again, don't worry about every detail of this, but the takeaway is that the ocean, the ocean can absorb some extra CO2, but a lot of extra CO2 throws this out of balance. And when this is thrown out of balance, it becomes a lot harder for carbonate organisms to survive. The last topic I want to talk about is the idea of feedbacks, positive and negative feedbacks. And I mentioned this concept previously. Um, a feedback is a response to a change, and it can be either a positive feedback in which the result amplifies the effect of that change and causes it to accelerate further, or it can be a negative feedback in which the result somewhat undoes the change and brings the system back to equilibrium. And scientifically, equilibrium means stability. It means that the interaction between the sun, which is providing solar radiation, and the ocean and the cryosphere or the ice sheets um, and the biosphere or just the living things on Earth, that those interactions are stable and self-regulating over, over a period of time, over a pretty long period of time. And in science, you often need to establish whether or not a system that you're interested in is in equilibrium if you want to draw conclusions. Um, for example, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere can roughly be correlated with ice levels and global temperatures, um, but that interpretation only works if you can determine that when you sampled the atmosphere, the atmosphere was in equilibrium. Um, so you would have to know, you would have to figure out that there wasn't an unusually large amount of CO2 being added or removed in a short period of time. And I, I find the term positive feedback amusing to me because it really has nothing whatsoever to do with whether the result is beneficial to humans, to wildlife, or anyone. Um, and often positive feedback in a scientific context involves out of control processes. Um, one way to remember it is that there can be kind of too much of a good thing. That's, that's, that's one way to think about it. And a number of examples of positive feedback are occurring with the current climate crisis. For example, the increased amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the resulting increased atmospheric temperature is causing glaciers to melt. Um, the white glaciers have a higher albedo than the gray to dark rocks that underlie them. And the rock absorbs a lot more radiation than the glacier. The glacier is going to reflect a lot of that radiation. Albedo, high albedo means that you reflect a lot of the radiation. And this has the potential to accelerate global warming. The ice melts because it's getting warm. And then the earth gets even warmer because the ice, which reflected some of the radiation away, is just gone now. Um, and another example is the ocean acidification mess because CO2 dissolves better in water when it's colder, but seawater is getting warmer from global warming. So that's actually making it harder for CO2 to just remain dissolved in the ocean as gas, and it's producing more carbonic acid now um, and accelerating ocean acidification. So the permafrost example is kind of a scary one because that's an example of this ice in the soil melting, and that creates all sorts of present problems for, for flooding and waterloggedness. Um, in these areas, but there is methane within the water. There's methane ice within the water ice. And if that melts, that releases methane into the atmosphere, which is an even worse greenhouse gas than CO2. So this result of global warming, AKA permafrost melting is causing something that's going to make global warming even worse. So that is positive feedback. And the basically positive feedback takes a system far, farther and farther away from equilibrium. And that's what's happening with the current climate crisis. Earth is very much in a period of disequilibrium because carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are being released into the atmosphere a lot faster than they can be absorbed by natural processes. It's going to take centuries or millennia for levels to get back to normal ranges on their own. And that's assuming that society was to just stop emitting CO2 all of a sudden and completely we switch off it's dependent on fossil fuels. Um, we're going to be stuck with the consequences of global warming for a long time. And we already have to deal with all of the greenhouse gases we've emitted and we are still continuing to emit more. And I've brought up the Permian extinction a few times as kind of a comparison and it's really one of the very few natural events that really compares. 
Um, and it really does kind of eerily seem very similar to the current climate crisis. The best hypothesis, remember, was that a massive, massive volcanic eruption ignited coal across a wide swathe of Siberia. And part of it was that the coal was, in many cases, buried less deeply because the Carboniferous had happened literally right before this. Um, now many more of those rocks are covered by, by subsequent younger rocks. Um, but the coal was pretty close to the surface at, that, at this point because the Carboniferous happened and then the Permian happened. Not a lot of new rock had formed in between. So a lot of coal being ignited released a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere and that caused global warming, which strained ecosystems on land and in the ocean. But in the ocean, you have the added problem of ocean acidification, runaway ocean acidification. And at this point also, many marine organisms built carbonate shells. You had, um, you had a lot of creatures that don't exist today anymore, like trilobites and rugos corals, which are a, basically a, a distant relative of today's living corals. And really, almost all of it went extinct. The marine life that exists today is descended from the mere 4% of groups that survived the Permian extinction. Um, in the ocean, that is. Terrestrial life was not as badly affected, and the ocean acidification hypothesis seems to explain that, because it sucked everywhere, but the oceans got acid to deal with also. <laughs> And on land, the, the dominant land animals went into sharp decline. The synapsids, which were the mammal ancestors, went from being the main land animals to being rats, basically, by the end of the next period. Um, and then they rebounded again when dinosaurs went extinct, mostly, but way down the line. And really, all signs point to the fact that we are attempting, that we are running an experiment to repeat this, that we are basically running an experiment to replicate the Permian extinction. And at the risk of editorializing, I say this is a really terrible idea. This is not an experiment we should be running. Um, this would be better for computer models. Anyway, on that rosy, rosy note, we will move on to the next chapter. Um, the next class, we will talk about the effects of climate change in Antarctica. I do want to apologize for for being, I'm, I'm a bit tired right now, so I'm not quite as together as I've always been. I apologize for that. Um, but um, if you're watching this before Wednesday, March 3rd, there will be a review session based on the last two History of Antarctica lectures on March 3rd. And this and the March 3rd Global Climate and Antarctica lecture will be the last two new lectures. So um, have a good night or day or, or whatever's going on when you when you watch this. And let me know if you have questions.